Hello, and welcome back to the Build Smart Podcast with Claire, where we discuss new and innovative ways to create healthier, more efficient buildings for occupant well-being and operational excellence. To access this episodes and others, check out Build Smart with Claire wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm your host, Harry Watson, and today we have a very special guest, Liam Bates, the founder and CEO of Kytera, a leading provider of smart air quality monitoring solutions built for smart buildings and healthy homes worldwide. Hello, Liam. How are you today? I'm good. Thanks. Great. I'm glad to have you on here. Um, so just to kind of uh, start off with a little bit about yourself so our audience can get to know you a little bit better, do you mind telling us a little bit about what you, what you do, how you got started out, and kind of what led you to building Kaitera into what it is today? Yeah, sure. So yeah, I grew up in Switzerland, which, uh, you know, my house really like, looks like a postcard. <laughs> <laughs> a with cows around and lots of green grass and a very bright blue sky. And you, know, you can see sort of over the borders into France and Germany and Italy. Um, so, you know, super sort of natural, clean environment. And uh, then uh, a few years ago, I was living in Beijing, uh, in China, and you know, experienced was essentially some of the world's worst air pollution, particularly dur during those years, sort of 2013, 14, where there was what was what came to be known as the air apocalypse, uh, where you sort of you know, couldn't see across the street because pollution was so bad, and I guess that kind of just sparked a an interest in like learning more about this and trying to understand more about our environment uh, and what can we do to avoid air pollution reduce air pollution ultimately you know get rid of air pollution from the world and the more that you know i dug into this or we dug into this because we started to form a little team to tackle this problem uh, so the more we realized that the yeah, air pollution isn't just an an issue that's isolated to Beijing or New Delhi. It's really a problem that exists all over the world. And poor air quality also isn't what we always, you know, what you might think of with smokestacks and, and smog. Uh, there's a lot that can impact our health and our well being that's in the air or in the environment around us. And that can be outdoors and visible, but it can also be indoors. Um, and, you know, this exists on every continent. Uh, every corner of the world, there are you know, potential issues uh, in your environment, indoors or outdoors, that can make you, uh, you know, not not feel good, um, not live a healthy lifestyle, and that seemed like a, a sort of a problem worth tackling. So that's that's how Kaitera got started. For sure, yeah, that's definitely a um, noble cause right there. Um, could you tell us a little bit about Kaitera specifically about? Um like what your goals at Kytera are and what kind of the technology entails, anything that's worth noting? So as I was saying, we, we decided to tackle this issue of air quality or essentially the, the environment. And I think what we see as the biggest challenge is that there is a lack of information. And this can be in your home, uh, sort of, like, is my air good? Is my, you know, am I breathing safe air? Am I breathing, am I living in an environment that is going to make me a healthier and happier person or not? Mm -hmm. um, but it can also exist on a, on a much larger scale, you know, in a, in a building. Is, is this building uh, providing a safe environment for its occupants? Or at an even larger scale, you know, is this country, is this uh, city making educated decisions about air quality? And so that's kind of what we saw as, as the key is that there's a lack of information. If you don't know exactly what the problem is, if you don't know where the problems are coming from, you really cannot make intelligent and educated decisions to fix the problem. And uh, unfortunately, you know, the unfortunate reality is that, is that we see the results of this in a, a lot of decision making, both at the small scale in homes and buildings, but also at the national scale with policies uh, you know, that are attempting to improve air quality, but sometimes have absolutely no effect. And that's just because we don't know enough about it. So, you know, when we decided to, to tackle this problem, we thought sort of the, the, the best way to approach it would be to make devices that can 
provide that data. So, you know, in a nutshell, what we do is, is at Kaitara, we make monitors to help you measure air quality. And, you know, our goal is to make amazing products that provide reliable data, high accuracy data, so that you can make those educated decisions and, and no longer guess. And this could be indoors, it could be outdoors. Uh, and our ultimate goal is to be able to use all of this data to really understand what's going on in the environment so that we can eventually tackle both at a small scale, but also at a large scale, the, pollution, the, the problems of air pollution. Yeah, totally. I think that that's kind of a recurring theme when you talk about education. Um, I feel like the, the, the saying that what, what gets measured gets managed is very applicable here. And so if you have nothing to back, back up your decisions, no research, no data, then you really are kind of blind firing. So um, I know indoor air quality specifically, I mean, I know we're talking about air pollution and anywhere, but I know indoor air quality has become kind of a, a hot topic in, in these times after or during the COVID-19 pandemic. Have you seen right. like a, an increase in interest with these topics on your end from consumers, organizations, things like that? Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's always a few, there are always a few triggers. Uh, typically one would, would, would also be that we've seen in a lot in previous years is wildfires. That's when everyone wakes up. And in this year in California, particularly, uh, you know, it, it became sort of a visible enough problem that everyone woke up to it. But COVID-19 has definitely, I think, raised awareness, not just about indoor air quality, but uh, just the, the, the spaces that we spend our time in and how those are managed. And again, you know, to manage, you need to measure, like you said. They always, we've seen a big uh, sort of uptick in interest around COVID. And uh, especially, I mean, it, it was sort of worked out quite, quite early that you know, this is uh, airborne and you know, viruses are transmitted through particles in the air. And in an indoor space, you, you, have, you have a very complicated environment. You have ventilation that could be helping to reduce the number of you know, particles in the air, uh, you, you know, which, which, which could also be helping to maintain the right levels of uh, humidity, for example, but you, if a system isn't well designed, you might also just have a system that's <laughs> you know, pulling potentially contaminated air around the building. And that is something that you definitely don't want to have. So there's, there's I think the, the impact of having the right system on the potential for transmission of any virus, but you know, COVID is obviously the one on top of everyone's mind, mm -hmm. is, is, is huge. And so really, yeah, that's why measuring is absolutely critical here. Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, the wildfires were definitely, um, I'm out on the West Coast, so I saw it firsthand, you know, uh, orange, gray skies, things like that. And people get really concerned about, like, have become really concerned about what they're actually breathing especially like you said in the places where they spend most of their time which is indoors um i guess going um to kind of assuming that there is a bit of a um a uptick in um the importance of safe facilities healthy buildings things like that do you do you see that air quality monitoring is playing a big role in trying to um adopt these new standards i guess we're talking a lot about the importance of the um, the measurement aspect, but uh, what kind of what kind of challenges do you think that the air quality monitoring solutions kind of play um, when it comes to these challenges? Yeah, so I think it's really interesting. You know, you mentioned you see the orange sky during wildfire, and that's I mean that's sort of similar to the experience that I had in Beijing where you, you, you see it, this thing which is, you know, was invisible becomes visible. And that's when you suddenly go, oh, mm. but that's, that's, that's way too late. <laughs> Absolutely. And, um, so, so I think, you know, COVID has also been an example of where this invisible problem has become visible in a different, in a different way. You know, we're not mm -hmm. seeing yeah, but um, there's enough information out there that people uh, sort of become become aware and see the problem. Uh, now, of course, this is a problem that was there before, and it's it's going to be here in the future. And you know, 
even after COVID-19 has, you know, everyone's been vaccinated and there's, there's no transmission. Uh, we really need to be designing buildings, designing spaces in a way that we can prevent these problems from happening in the future. And, uh, you know, I mean, obviously I hope there's, there's no sort of pandemic 2.0 around the corner with, with some new disease, uh, you know, but we should be in a state where we're prepared for that and not 10 years down the road that something else happens and we're right back where we were with no improvements. And I think people, people are, are you know, realizing this. And so definitely air quality is becoming a you know, monitoring measurement is becoming, I think, a, a standardized part of what, what a building would be looking to do. Uh, you, know, you, yeah. you take control your lighting, you, you do a lot of things for energy efficiency, uh, and you should also be you know, taking these, these boxes for um, you know, monitoring of the indoor environment and, and air quality. And there's a few yeah. things here that we'll need to think, to keep in mind when they're doing this. And, and this is what we get from a lot of discussions with, with partners or building managers that we see implementing solutions. Um, basically, you know, you've got to have a strategy around this. It's uh, all of these things work together. If, if you're going to ventilate, if you're going to make uh, policies for how to improve into air quality, you, you need to be measuring it. Uh, you need to have a plan for, for monitoring um, and you know, move away from perhaps the, the, the system that we had before, which is where someone comes in once a year or once every six months, takes a reading and walks out, because that really doesn't tell you much about the space. Uh, it doesn't tell you what's actually going on. So I think it's, it's really worth the effort for, you know, be it facility managers, building owners, uh, just, you know, company executives who are mm -hmm. care about this to sit down and work out what is their strategy uh, to, to deal with, you know, the future, but also today. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think the two, uh, two things you, you just mentioned there that really kind of resonate are, like one, the fact that air quality is so, or air pollution, air quality, all these things are so dynamic. And so when you have someone that comes in once, once every six months, once, once every year, you're getting a read on your air quality at that one point in time. You know, if something happens after the fact or something that happened, you know, months earlier, you'll have no idea about that. And you'll also have no idea on how to solve that. And uh, number two, I think the, the fact that um, although COVID-19 and wildfires and things like that are kind of bringing these problems to light. There's always been the flu. There's always been other viruses that transmit through the air. And we've always known that these ventilation systems, um, you know, ventilation systems, air filtration, all these things are kind of viable um, aspects of your building, building to manage to reduce that. So mm -hmm. that's a really, that is a really interesting point because um, it's not just COVID-19. It's not just wildfires it's all of these other things that we've known about for years so i, I do think that's important for, for the audience to know that as well um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of data just quickly on on you know even pre-covid 19 i mean there's, there's there's quite a few studies looking at you know the impact of reducing certain pollutants on the amount of um, you know, sick leave taken mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, you know, obviously that's framing it from, from, from a sort of a, a corporate, like, you know, oh, we can redu you know, reduce the amount of sick leave, you know, but the more human way to look at that is people were getting sick in the office before and, you know, with, with an optimized indoor environment, they aren't. And that's a great thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Not, and it's, it's, it even goes past just the, you know, productivity aspect. It's just feeling healthy and comfortable in the place where you're literally at for eight hours a day. So for sure. And yeah, it's a it's a win 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 for everybody when you can you know give your your occupants a healthier building and you can get more done. You know, so yeah, definitely. Um, do you think that there is any like key f things to consider for building managers and things like that? Um, because a lot of them are trying to meet you know these new standards and guidelines for building health. Um, do you think there are uh, like some most important factors to kind of look at or um, w what do you think about that for for these people that are facing the challenges yeah so definitely i think you know thinking sort of holistically and strategically is really important 
Mm -hmm. So, if, I mean, if you're going for some sort of certification, then it's you know be a sort of, you know well uh, reset lead uh, you know fit well. These these are all sort of standards and certifications that that come up quite a lot now. Uh, you know, work that out early enough <laughs> so that. Uh, because there, there there are you know requirements around uh, continuous monitoring, uh, what the average area covered by monitors should be, uh, a lot of different things like that. And then, you know, I think there's there's there's, there's a huge opportunity there to not just tick some boxes on certification, but really to make a a large improvement to the the indoor environment. And a lot of that can be done through. Um, you know, connecting to the the building management system, uh, connecting to the um, you know the AHU to be able to pull in more fresh air if necessary, or you know reduce fresh air if there's nobody in the space. There's a lot of different things that can be done around automation, as well to make sure that the space you don't just know what the problems are, but you can then work on fixing them, which is obviously every, everybody's goal. So. Yeah, thinking, you know, taking all those things to, into account. Also, there's a lot of other things that you, you can think about. For example, uh, outdoor air quality. Right now, everyone's talking about ventilating. You know, that's 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 okay. But what happens when there's a wildfire outside and you have to ventilate? <laughs> and you you have this very sort of tricky equation that you need to balance. So, if I open the windows, the building is filled with smoke. Um, but if I close it, potentially I'm recirculating too much air. Uh, and you know, there's there's a lot of there are answers to all of these questions. Yeah. Uh, I guess another thing to, to keep in mind would obviously, you know, to, to, to speak to somebody that is quote unquote, you know, an expert in this field, um, somebody that can provide a little bit more insight into what, what, what aspects you might want to be thinking of when you're, when you're designing this. Yeah. It's, it's not really just enough to, like you said, check the boxes, get the data, um, you actually want to take action from that data. So, because the goal, like you said, is to actually make improvements. And if you're just, you know, assessing your building all the time and not actually doing anything with that measurement data, um, it's kind of, it's kind of um, a lost cause. So yeah, Absolutely. definitely. And um, I think another interesting point you brought up was the applications for um, using this data to kind of autonomize other aspects of your, your building. And I think that that's one thing Kaiteri does well is having the integration abilities to work with BMS systems, uh, building management systems, things like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of where we're headed right now. And, you know, in the next um, several years is kind of being able to, you know, almost with a flip of a switch, be able to optimize your environment with the real time data that you're getting in. So, yeah, that's that's um, yeah, absolutely. that's awesome. Um, so then one other thing that has been kind of gaining a lot of traction, quote unquote, are these kind of advanced clean air technologies. So, um, a lot of vendors and stuff that sell, uh, bipo bipolar ionization units or, um, portable air purifiers, um, other things that kind of clean the air, or reduce indoor pollutants. Do you have any uh, experience with the efficacy of these solutions? This is really one of the reasons why we got started doing, you know, at Kaitera, is because sort of going back to what I said at the very beginning, the problem is that you don't, you, because you can't see the air, you don't know what's working or not working. And the reality is that something could be very, very effective or it could be doing absolutely nothing. And it could be anywhere in the middle as well. And sometimes that's not a problem with the product. I mean, I remember when I first purchased an air purifier for my house, you know, I was running it. And then after that started to measure the air quality and was shocked that the air wasn't actually improving that much. And it wasn't so much a problem with the purifier. It was just that I hadn't understood really sort of the, the, the ratio of, you know, how much air can be purified versus the area of my space. Mm -hmm. And you know, I probably had something that was suitable for a bedroom trying to purify an entire house and it just wasn't working. And then, you know, somebody on the other side of the house had the window open a crack and that was enough to sort of negate all effects. So that is, you know, really one of the core fundamental reasons why we started working on monitoring because, the, you know, the last thing you want to do is, is 
spend a bunch of money implementing a solution either in your house or you know in an entire building and then be scratching your head as to whether or not it's working or whether or not it will work uh, so when it comes to actual solutions you know definitely we've you know we we've seen bipolar ionization be implemented in uh, a lot of different places um, you know, we've, we've, we've got uh, a few partners that, that use solutions like that and use our monitors to measure. And, you know, some examples of that would be um, you know, Virgin cruise ships, I know, have, have implemented this and uh, are using our uh, like monitors to, to measure what's going on in the space. Um, U.S. Bank Stadium, uh, quite a few others. Same thing with portable air purifiers. Uh, you know, there, there, there are a lot of examples of these being implemented in spaces and having you know a massive effect on reduction of particulate matter so i mean these are great things because if you if you if you lower these then you know you're reducing the risk for virus transmission you're helping people live healthier life and of course you're also increasing um sort of confidence in the space, as as you know, as a as a user of the space, when I'm there and I see these things are operating, I see data on the wall. I think that that's also a really important part of it is is measuring, but also the ability to tell stakeholders, uh, be it you know management, building owners, or the people just in the space that okay, there's a there's a number on the wall and it's green. Um, you know that's 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 really valuable. Now, of course, it is important to make sure that you know a the I wouldn't say that the technology is working. It's more that you've got the right technology for your situation, or for your you know specific uh, space and circumstances. Mm -hmm. If you've got very high levels of you know outdoor air coming into the space, a portable purifier won't necessarily work for you. And you can do a lot more just by optimizing the filtration as that outdoor air comes into the space. There's there's, there's a lot of different things here, and that's why at the end of the day, I always say you know like put in some monitors. Do, do a little trial on one part of your building, uh, you know, run a small pilot, put in a few monitors, get the data before you implement the solution, put the solution in, see how the numbers change, and then that will give you confidence on uh, you know, whether or not you, you want to roll this out or you want to try a different solution. And so that's where it's important to be able to access that data, download it, really you know, look at the graphs and see before after comparisons. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it's like the the trust aspect. It's not only that you want that you don't want to. It's not just that you want to have confidence as the person that's installing these new solutions. You also want to give that trust to the people that are actually using the space. And so I, I've seen definitely um, some studies that where the kind of uh, sentiment on indoor air quality is growing from you know people that might not be in the industry at all have never heard of indoor air quality before. And now that these these things are becoming increasingly popular that, hey, I would like to see um, some data on this indoor space before I enter it. Or I would at least like to see that, you know, we have sufficient air quality so that we're not exacer exacerbating other problems out there. And then on the flip side, um, being able to be be confident that, you know, you just spent this money and now you can tell that it worked. I think that yeah. that's um, a very powerful case for the people in the situation where they're trying to manage budgets. They don't want to, you know, they don't want to buy the wrong solution. Um, yeah. So having the data to back it up is is definitely invaluable. So I think one, just to add on to that really quickly, I think one one interesting kind of aspect that we're seeing as well is because you you have monitors which are connected. They're not just being held by a person who's taking mm -hmm. a reading. And it, it, you also have the potential for multiple people to access this information. And, you know, we recently just, just rolled out um, a feature, for example, with organization accounts, which allows multiple people to have different permissions to view data. And, and a really interesting example of, of how this is actually applied is you might have the solution provider. And what I mean by the solution provider here is, here is for example, a company that offers bipolar ionization. And, you know, they help you install it. And once that setup is actually installed, then they will also be able to keep track of the readings of what's going on in the space and see, you know, if there is an issue. Because you know, sometimes somebody just does something silly, like they, you know, I don't know, put cotton wool in the 
you know, when the filtration pipes are in the, in the ducts or, you know, someone closes something they shouldn't have and suddenly things stop working. And now you have the, the possibility to A, find out in real time via, you know, alerts and notifications and B, have multiple people looking at this and coming at it from their own perspective. So, you know, the, like the bipolar ionization supplier might be looking at this information and go, okay, that's not normal. And you can also take this information and then display it to the, the end user on the TV or send email reports. So I think this is just a massive sort of like a huge benefit of moving away from the, like dare I say, archaic methods. Yeah. <laughs> you know, walking around with a, a, an offline monitor to a, a connected, you know, 24 seven operating device. Yeah, for sure. That kind of puts some of the, um, some not I don't want to say responsibility, but at least some of the information in the supplier's hand to where, like you said, they can actually for themselves, they can say, hey, we, we are doing what our product says is going, going to do. And here's the proof of that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that that's that is an interesting take that I didn't, even, I didn't consider before. But that's um, I think that's definitely important for, for those vendors and, and um, businesses like that. Um, so we talked a lot about air quality monitoring. I just kind of want to wrap things up on, on the air quality monitoring side of things. Um, is, do you have any, like, what, what would you say to someone that has just stumbled upon air quality monitoring, let's say in a commercial setting? Um, what, what advice would you give them? Like any best practices that you would offer to them to start? Yeah, I guess probably the most important thing is knowing what you're, what, what your goal is. Mm -hmm. Are you going for certification? Um, are you trying to sort of convey information to the users in the space? Are you trying to really understand what is like at a very granular level what's going on? Because this, this, this will impact the decisions you make about, you know, how many devices you might want to install, where you might want to install them, are you going to be looking at outdoor data as well as indoor data, etc. Uh, I think that's 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 a really important starting point. The other thing, the other thing would be uh, sort of thinking long term and more big picture. So, like, uh, don't ignore maintenance. <laughs> this is you know this is something that uh, it, when you're installing an air quality monitor, it's you know, you're not putting it in for two years. This, this is something that should be in for a long period of time and it's gonna help you over many, many years to come optimize your space. And you still do have, it is a scientific instrument sitting on the wall or potentially the ceiling, taking these measurements. Uh, you need to make sure that this is a device that you can keep calibrated. Uh, at Kytera, we've designed devices so that they're very, very easy to calibrate. You just have some modules that you can, you can replace. Um, but regardless of what sort of device you might be implementing, you know, make sure that there is a strategy in place to be able to keep them calibrated. You know, if that is either sort of our solution of replacing modules, or if it's the more traditional method of taking the device off the wall, shipping it to the manufacturer and having them recalibrate it and send it back. Um, you know, either, either of those could work. Just make sure that there's a strategy in place and you know what, what is involved and what the costs are. Because, you know, I've seen or heard of too many projects where, three years down the road, the device needs recalibration and there's no, no one's doing it. <laughs> yeah. And at that, you know, you might, it, like bad data is, you know, can be worse than no data. So that's really important. Uh, finally, I guess just small kind of plug here. <laughs> uh, you know, if you're interested, you should check out the free, we just put up like a free crash course on, uh, you know, choosing an air quality monitor for your building on our uh, website and LinkedIn page. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Check that out. There's a bunch of information in there. It's maybe something that I missed. That is a great course. That's that should be very uh, valuable to those that are looking to get started, especially in the commercial space. Um, all right. So now, um, kind of just on like a broader um, topic, while we're on the conversation of just um, you know building health, air pollution, things like that. Um, I just wanted to kind of finish off th this podcast with. A question for you, which is, um, do you have like three top tips for those in the audience that are looking to optimize their building for safety, health, uh, smartness of it? Do you, would you say you have uh, three tips for those in the audience? So I think number one, sort of the, the one that, that 
comes to mind is, is uh, you know, think about continuous monitoring. And you know, this, this, this could be air quality, but it could be everything else that relates to health, safety, wellness. Like we are definitely moving in the direction of understanding what is going on over an extended period of time rather than that so one point in time measurement. Um, the obvious example is, I mean, yeah, you, 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 wouldn't, you wouldn't have somebody come in once a year to measure the temperature of your office and then make a decision based upon that. Like <laughs> winter and summer are probably pretty different. Um, and you wouldn't be able to optimize your heating and cooling if you only had one data point. So the, the same logic applies to everything in this space. Uh, continuous monitoring is definitely uh, something that, that you should be thinking about. Also, I guess just, uh, you know, I mean, maybe I'm repeating myself here a bit, but having a long-term strategy in place, it's not just an issue with air quality, but for other aspects as well, make sure that you're, you're not just looking at the next 12 months, but you know, how, what's this gonna look like in five years? What's this gonna look like in 10 years? And make sure that there's, things are built in a way where, you know, you can gain more information and make, continue making educated decisions into the future. And I guess the last one would be, you know, uh, this is a big topic and I, mean, I, could, I could sort of talk anyone's ear off for hours when it comes to air quality. Uh, it's something that I'm really passionate about, but it's, it's going to be really hard for a, a building owner, uh, you know, or a facility manager to become an expert on every single one of these topics. I mean, I don't know anything about many of the other topics related to health and wellness and safety, but they're all important. And there's nothing you can really overlook here. So, you know, I think, I think talk, talk to experts, talk to consultants um, that, that, you know, know the area based on whatever concerns you might have to, to try and work out so what the best strategy is. It's, it's it, yeah, it's a, there's a lot of content out there to absorb. So I guess you know, talk to other people. And, you know, <laughs> it's probably a good starting point. I guess just finding those people that have been there and done that. Um, those are, right. those are great. Yeah. Those are great um, topics to leave off on. This has been um, very informative for myself, hopefully for the audience as well. So I'd like to thank you, Liam, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. yeah absolutely. And um, to anybody else watching this right now, um, you can find out more information um, at kaitera.com and you can also find um, this podcast and others um, at the build smart podcast with Claire wherever you watch podcasts and you can find more information, show notes at i-claire.com. Thank you.